Praise the Lord. Take your Bible, turn to Judges 7. And you're right, we'd be here all day to talk about just how good God is to us, what He's done for us, what He's given us, what He's blessed us with, because there is nothing that we have that we deserve. Even if you have something, even if you had three strokes, that's better than what we deserve. Because having a stroke is not the same as hell. Having cancer is not the same as going to hell. Having arthritis and this cold, chilly weather coming in. That's not as bad as dying and going to hell. And God has saved the best of us. And God has saved the worst of us. And there's people from all walks of life sitting in this building. Let me run down some of the people that are here. Not naming names. We have drunkards. Adulterers. Lascivious people. We have drug addicts. We have thieves. We have liars. We have blasphemers. Should I go on? All of those people are in this room today. By the way, before I forget, I got to pull this up so I can remember their name. Turn around and say hello to the people at Loonguruman Village in Kenya. We thought we wouldn't be able to stream today because our computer went. And a guy offered us to fix it and he's going to charge us half of what it would cost just buy a new one. I said, we're going to buy a new one. Okay? So that we can keep going out to the villages and streaming the gospel so that they can be part of our Thanksgiving service. We wish that all of you could be here and we would be glad to feed every one of you. And so, thank you God for bringing us together. Amen? Gideon, Gideon, uh, Judges chapter 6, the story of Gideon, uh, we talked about the fleeces last Sunday morning, he laid the fleece out, he did it twice, he wanted that double witness before God. I've recorded a Watchman broadcast, going to be out today, and it's on the number two, and, and I mentioned this, the double witness of how God speaks. God speaks once, yea, twice, Job said. David said, God speaketh once. Twice have I heard this. We have Jesus, who is the Word of God, who has come to us once, and He's coming again. That's God's two witnesses. He witnessed and testifies of Himself, and that is the two witnesses of the Word of God. And if God's going to say anything to you, He's going to say it at least twice, Sometimes, like with Samuel, he had to say it four times. Sometimes God's got to say it more than that to us before we finally wake up and realize it. Amen? But Gideon wanted to make sure... I mean, he's putting his life on the line. He's going out against three unstoppable armies. You know what that is, don't you? Those three enemies. He's going out against them... And he's got to know whether or not he's going to live through it. Putting his life on the line. So God, I've got to know. Joshua made the mistake of going against Ai without even hearing from God once. And it cost him his men. It cost him his army. And those men from Ai defending their own village, defending their own town, defeated the armies of Israel. 
And Joshua learned his lesson. I should have asked God first whether we could go against him. And so he had to suffer the consequences. And, jo and, and uh, Gideon, I guess, knows a little bit about Joshua. And he says, you know what, I'm not going to make that mistake. So we asked God twice. God is faithful. God answered him twice. And now, here's that other story. So we know the stories of Gideon. We know that he laid a fleece out before the Lord. And then the next thing we know about his army is that he musters all of this huge army. As many men as he can get, as many swords, as many shields, as many spears and arrows, as, as many men to flank them, as many men to surround him. He's got to have as many men as he possibly can to defeat this unstoppable army. And God's going to lay it to him straight. Gideon, you got too many men. It's not that you're too weak. It's with some of you, it's that you're too strong. And God doesn't operate that way. So Judges chapter 7, verse 1. Then Jeroboam, remember what that name means. Baal hates Gideon. What that name means. Baal contends with Gideon. Baal hates Gideon. Baal's going to fight Gideon. And that's Gideon's new name. Jared Baal. I'm the one who is against Baal. I would, wouldn't mind the name of Jerob Satan. I'm the one who is against Satan. Amen. New name. Then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early. Did you hear that, teenagers? They got up early. Amen. Amen. Just hard to get some of them up early. Amen. And they got rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them, by the hill of Morah in the valley. Study, if you're going to study something in your Bible this week, study the north. There is an enemy that's coming to us out of the north. Now watch this. I'm going to throw this in. This is free. You don't have to tithe on this one. When God told Moses to set the tabernacle out, he made it in a certain way. And he said, Moses, he said, I want the most holy place on the west. I want the entry gate on the east. So that when they come in, he's going to come in like the sun going from east to west. And he said, inside the tabernacle, inside the holy place, I want you to put the candlestick on the south side. And I want you to put the table with 12 fresh loaves of bread on that table. I want you to put it on, as you're going in on the right side which is going to be the north because God has prepared a table in the presence of mine enemies. Amen. Somebody say amen. That means here's your enemies up there on the north. God says, come in, sit down with me and let's eat and let's just aggravate the devil. Amen. Oh, he's still coming, but we're going to aggravate him. Amen. So, verse 2, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many. Too many. For me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves. What does that word mean? Puffed up. Vaunt themselves. Exalt themselves. Vaunt, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand, underline that phrase, hath saved me. Mine own hand has saved me. Did your hand save you? And it never will. In fact, Jesus said, if it offends you, cut it off. Now some say, well, he didn't really mean that. Well, listen, if I had leprosy or an infection in my right hand and it couldn't go away, 
they're going to cut that thing off so that the rest of me stays alive. I would rather go through life without an offending hand than I would to have that hand offend and then kill the rest of the body. Sometimes God's got to purge some things out of us. Some things maybe we want to keep. But when it comes to your hand, you cannot and should not ever say, mine own hand has saved me. There's too much of that doctrine in churches. And I'm going to say this. The bigger the church is, the more that's there. Look around you. See those empty spots? They've been there for years. And I got cocky with God one day years ago, 22 some odd years ago, 21 years ago. We had an Easter service, had a bunch of people here. And I walked through the foyer back there on my way to the bathroom. When I come out, I looked at the sign. It said 126. And I thought to myself, I'm doing a pretty good job here. And when I, I'm not kidding you. When I walked into this room, God smote me. Like my mama coming up behind me, grabbing my shirt collar. And the Holy Ghost drug me down to the altar. And God said, Mike, it's never about you. And if you think that way, then I'll take you out and put somebody else in that I can work with. Now, I will be the one who brings people in. And I will be the one who takes people out. And if you're okay with that, then I'll bless you in what you're doing. But if you're going to start thinking that you are doing this, I'll take you out. And I knew it. And I spent time down there weeping and confessing my arrogance, confessing, forgetting who I was. Forgetting what God had already done. And I repented. And I said, God, from now on, I will let you build your church. And I can say that God has done a far better job than I ever could have imagined. We got people here from Lost Wages, Nevada. They are part of it. They're not here because they just needed a church. They were just driving by and decided to fall in. They're here because they are part of us online. And they wanted to come here and make y'all something good for Thanksgiving dinner. Okay? Holly's here all the way from Festus. She'd been part of us. We didn't even know her. She didn't even know us. But she knew me. She said, you're Pastor Mike, aren't you? I said, do I look the same? She said, yeah. I went, oh, okay. But God is the one who brings them in. And it's not my hand, and it's not your hand. It's God. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for opening our eyes to this. Thank you, God, for showing us your word. Thank you, God, for what you've done here in this place. God, I could have never, I could have and would have never done the things that you've done here. It would have never came into my mind that God, you did it. And God, you're the one who brings the increase. You're the one who purges a little. You're the one who causes people to live, who causes people to die. You're the one that calls people to salvation. You're the one that judges sinners. You're the one. It's always you. And God, this Bible is right. When we think that we're strong, you can't use us. 
So God, teach us that you did not make us strong. You did not make us smart. You did not make us of good bloodlines. You did not make us the strongest, the mightiest, the most popular, the richest. You did not make us that way. You called the foolish and the ignorant. You called the weak so that you could bring down the strong. God, show us that in your word today. And Father, help us, dear God, to not even boast about how weak we are, except that we boast of the cross. Let that be our glory and our boasting this morning. Bless and honor your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Now look down uh, verse 3. Down at verse 3. I don't have this on the screen. I want you to look in your Bible. Now therefore, go to... This is what God, this God's plan. Proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And their return of the people, watch this, 20 and 2,000 people people left the army all at once fearful and afraid and what I get now I'm fearful and afraid most of the time but what I'm getting out of this is these are the watch this now these are the people who didn't really really want to be there to begin with and I'm saying to you today that there isn't any doubt in my mind that there's always somebody who's in church or somebody who's watching online and somebody is saying to you, now sit down and watch this now. Sit down and listen to this. Come to church with us. But you don't really want to be here. And let me tell you, if you don't want to be here, God doesn't want you here either. And at some point, He will separate you from His house, from His congregation, from His spirit, from His Word, God will separate you out from that and you will not be bothered by God ever again. You better hope and pray that God never does that to you. Man, I've had that thought. I've had, uh, have you not? I've had that thought before. God, what if you don't want me? God, what if I grow cold on you? God, what, what would happen then? God, is there any way that you would toss me out? That you would put me out? That's called the fear of the Lord. And it's one of the seven spirits of God. And I think you ought to at least think of then. And tell, if this Thanksgiving time, that tell God thank you that He hasn't thrown you out yet. Those are the people that didn't want to be part of the battle. Look, watch this. Those three armies are the sins that we commit. And what he's saying here is, there's always some people who don't want to fight that battle. They would rather let the sins come in and take over so they can at least have a good time while they pretend to be a Christian. There's people like that in every church. There's people like that all over the world. There's people like that probably sitting online. They would rather not be here. They'd rather not be listening. They don't want to fight the battle against their own sins. And so God says, you don't want to fight it? Fine, get out. Move on. And again, you better hope and pray that that's not you. Now we have, notice the number here, 10 thousand anytime you have 10 in the bible what do you think of huh dominion the law 10 commandments got 10,000 people here you know what god's going to say that's not sufficient that's not the number that i want so we got 10,000 left 22,000 left so we know at least we've got 32,000 people gathered here 22,000 are taken out instantly that's over two-thirds. The Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down under the water, uh, uh, unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. Now, I've analyzed this. I've studied this. I've read over it. I've thought theologically about it. 
And I don't really know why God selected the people that He did. And God doesn't really tell us, but those are the ones that He picked. So let's look at it. Verse 5, So He brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And of the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, they went... Isn't that gross? Don't you hate it when people make noise when they're drinking or eating? We consider that rude in our culture, don't we? So we'll be careful when we go downstairs now and eat turkey and gravy and drink water and tea and coffee that we don't go. <laughs> Amen. We don't want to offend somebody. And yet, in some countries, it's an offense when you don't. I was waiting for Jared to burp right then on command. He just didn't. He let me down. But here's the lappers. And God said, now you set them aside. Verse 7, And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men, Oh, let me finish verse 6, But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. So I would assume that they stuck their face down in the water and sucked it up that way. I'm not sure... How I would do it, I usually use a glass or a cup. But if I was down at the riverside or the lakeside, I guess I would be more apt to stick my head down in there and just get a big mouthful of it. But here's what God said in verse 7. The Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped, will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. So the people took victuals in their hand and their trumpets and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath him in the valley. I see 300 men. I see three crosses on Golgotha. And I see Jesus numbered with the transgressors. And what I see here is the cross. And it's only the cross. That's going to save us. And the rest of the story is, if you know it, those 300 men, how many of them fought? None of them. Not one of them. They held the pitcher with the lamp in one hand, and they held up a sword in the other. And they shouted, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And that's what they were asked to do, and that's what they did. And the Midianites fled from before them. They won the battle. And they never even fought the battle. All they did was lift up the word of God. Jesus said, "I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So a role that we have in this church, a responsibility that we have in this church, is not to magnify Bethel, not to magnify the house, not to magnify the people, not to magnify the name or the church or what we do here. Our responsibility is to magnify and uplift Jesus Christ. When I heard the testimonies of people this morning, they stood with tears in their eyes and they didn't say, I did this, and I did that, and I thank God that I can do this. They said, thank God for what He did in my life. Amen. Or else, you don't get to testify here. You want to testify in this place? Stand up and tell us what God has done for you. What Jesus has done for you. How Jesus has... The first three people in this church that testified were the widows. That was just in my mind and in my heart. They're the ones who have a lot to be thankful for. Because 
in the absence of the husband, they have a greater husband that never leaves them and never will. Amen. Zechariah 4, I have it up on the screen. You can turn there in your Bible if you want, that way you can underline it. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might. I wanted to be a strong man for God. I wanted to be a strong man for my family. I wanted to be a strong, upstanding man for the church, for my family, for the, my friends and people around me. I wanted people to think that I was something, that I could do this, that I could do that. At one time, in my ignorant, stupid youth, I told myself, Mike, with your abilities, you can get any church you want. How stupid I was. How arrogant I was. And God took me and he wadded me up and he crumpled me down to nothing. And then he started reshaping me, remaking me, so that I realized I can do nothing. And I don't want to do anything. I want God to to do it and I'll go where God tells me to go and I'll let it be on him not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts first Corinthians chapter 1 turn there verse 26 for you see your calling brethren how that this, Jared, this, when you said that, I had this in mind. Not many, not, not that not many wise men after the flesh. Where's our doctors here? Where's our lawyers in this church? Where's our politicians? Where's our movie stars? Our TV stars? Our Broadway stars? Our, our football stars? You know, when, when Kurt Warner came and won the Super Bowl for us, and he, he said, first things first, thank you, Jesus, I thought, that's great, man. We got somebody that's famous now, and he's going to spread Jesus everywhere. And you know, you didn't hear much from him after that. I mean, he went around doing some good things, but you just didn't. And I thought that surely God would save some of the wealthy people, some of the famous people, because they've got a mouth and they can do this and they can do that. And that's not how God does it. It's not by the wise men after the flesh that God, God did not call them. God does not, he said, not many mighty. Now, yes, I do believe that there are some people who are spiritually, physically emotionally stronger than others because he didn't say not any mighty he said not many mighty and I've learned this over the years that while yes there may be some people who by their nature are good people they are good Christians they are good Bible believers they are good church members and certain things are just not an issue with them in their life Yes, there are people like that. But I know that there are more of us who are weak and foolish and are nothing more of us than there are the, of them. And God is going to use the weak, the foolish, the ones who are not the actors and the politicians and the lawyers and the judges and the doctors and the wealthy people. He's not calling them. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. Verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You see, God's being nicer than what I am sometimes. I'll just say what you did was out, Jared said this, stupid. 
What you did was stupid. Amen? When you look back on it, surely you can say, that was stupid. Why did I do that? Why did I say that? Why did I get involved in that? That was stupid. God's just being nice and calling you foolish. But He called you. Because you are foolish. And we got a church full of people. And we'll just have to get over this. We got a church full of people whose backgrounds, if we did a background check, we'd probably eliminate most of these people. And the ones saying amen, shaking their head, they're the ones that are going first. I mean, I know, I'm watching you guys shake your head saying amen, I'm going, they're guilty, I know who, I know who they are. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You see, the wise scientists and the wise medical doctors and the wise astrophysicists and the wise geologists, they all say that there is no God and the earth was made 13 billion years ago with the universe and life formed automatically on its own by itself and it's progressed to us. See, evolution is arrogance. Because evolution calls that man is climbing higher and ascending higher. But the truth of it is, man's not doing that. Man's going to hell. That's not high, that's low. God's going to bring him down to a place that's so low, it doesn't end being low. There's no end to the depth of it. That's where God is going to take most men who think that they're wise. But God's going to use... Who in here believes that God created the universe 6,000 years ago in six days? Raise your hand. You are smarter than anybody in the world because you believe that. And they compile all the evidence again. We've got carbon-14 dating. We've got things that are in this geological level here that are that, in the things that this... And this tells us that this was laid down first and this was laid down first. And, but there's always things that kind of mess up those, that data. You know what they do with that? They throw it out. They're wrong. And you're the one, and you didn't have to go to college to believe the Bible. You just read it and you believed it. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. I'm not going to ask you to stand up and tell us how weak you are. I just know that you are. And I know, and you know, and the devil knows where he can get you. Right? He knows where he can get you. Because he does it a lot, and you fall for it a lot because you can't stand against him. Why hasn't God eliminated that out of your life? Because he still wants you to know that you're not strong. You're weak. And you're going to stay weak. So that when the praise is given and the pat on the back. That belongs to Jesus. Not you. Let's hear some weak people give a real strong amen. amen. The things that are mighty. And the base things of the world. Base things. The low people. Now, we pretend this is not like this in America. And I will say it's not as bad as it is in other places. But in most places of the world, there are levels of human beings. Are there not? Do they not, in India, despise the low people? And you know what? I'm going to be honest. Even in India... It has everything to do with how dark or light they are. In India, if you're really, really dark, you're a dog. And you get a dog job if you get anything. And you live in a dog house. And you stay with the dog people. And it's the light-skinned that get the best jobs. And they're the politicians. And they're the, they get all the money and the wealth and the businesses and everything. It's that way. It's that way here, and it's that way all over the world. 
But let me tell you something. God can make you as dark as the black earth that you came from. And you're the one that God loves the most. God loves you. And God wants to lift you up. Even if the man wants to put you down. That's good preaching, isn't it? So that's... Oh, we don't bring race into it. Why not? Everybody else is. So let's, let's tell the truth. Red and yellow. They are... Jesus loves the little children of the world. And the things which are... Watch this. The base things of the world. Watch this. And the things which are... Look at that word. Despised. If they despise you, listen, when I go to Kenya, I find great faith. You know why? They don't have anything else. When I go to Kenya, I hear these people talk about how God is going to heal them from their diseases. And I thought about that, and I thought, why not? Because they don't have health care. They don't have Blue Cross, Blue Shield. They don't have Geico. If you bring your child to the hospital door and he's dying, you have to make sure you bring the money with you or they reject him in Kenya. That's how it's done. A woman who is dying in childbirth will die at the door of the hospital because she can't pay to get the C-section done. That's happened before to people that we know in Kenya. If you die, you have to wait to be buried until you have the money in your hand. No matter how long that is, they cannot even bury you until you got the money in hand. And when I go over there, I see great faith because they don't have anything else. So we in America, we have it, but we don't have a lot of faith, do we? But when God starts taking things away from us, like I was talking about in Sunday school, when God starts taking away things from us, that's when we learn how to depend on God because we really don't have anything. God did us a favor by taking it away. Can I hear God's people say amen? The things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and the things which are not to bring to naught means nothing, things that are that no flesh, look at verse 29, that no flesh should glory in His presence. My flesh is weak, wicked. The older I get, the more I see it. And I've begged God, I'm like you, I've begged God, God strengthen me, God make me better, God make me do better. God make me think better. God make me see better. God make me stand better. God make me better. And God hasn't said no. He's just said, I'm better. And you will be in me. And I will be in you. And that's how you are better. Because it's me. And nobody else. It's not, listen Bethel, it's not the church of 10,000 people that brag about what they're doing and what they're accomplishing that's really accomplishing what God actually wants. Oh, they're doing what they want, but it's not what God wants. It's not the church of 5,000. It's not church to 500. It's the church of 50 and 60 and 70 and 80. And we may not hear 
be any bigger than that. My goodness. God sends a lady to us and then takes her out the next week. But you know what? Wouldn't bother me if God did that every week. God did not use Bethel Church and Mike Hoggard because of how good we are and how strong we are. He uses us because we're not who we thought we once were. Nod your head and say amen if God has taught you that you are not who you thought you were. I thought of myself pretty high. And God taught me, Mike, that's not who you are. So God has a way of reminding me that I'm not that person. But I know the one who is. His name's Jesus. And it's about the cross. And it's about what God does and not us. I got a lot of other verses of scripture. Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world's crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul's glory was in the cross. Deuteronomy 8, 11, God said, thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand hath gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is He that giveth thee power to get well. Isaiah 10. And let me move on. Romans 6. For he that is dead is free from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over Him, for in that He died, He died unto sin once, but in that He liveth, He liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also, watch this, this is you. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. You are dead, and dead people cannot do anything. It is Christ the, is the only one who is alive in us, causing us to do what it is that we do. If you love somebody, it's because Christ put it in you to love them. If you do good for somebody, it's because Christ put it in you. And Christ did that through you. That's the way He chose to do it. He chose to take, He chose to make of His bride the worst people in the world so that they, through Him, become God's best. For, say this with me, Ephesians 2.8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. God did you a favor by taking the army down to where it was almost nothing. Because God wanted you to never, ever think that you are saved by your own hand. Bow our heads. I'm going to open up these altars, these benches. And I want, if God's dealing with you about it, it didn't even have to be what I was preaching on. Maybe God's just nailing you about something. And He's been hitting you all week. And you're looking at that altar going, man, I ought to be down there. Roy, when you go to an AA meeting, it's because you're a drunk, right? And when you go, you have to say in front of everybody, my name is Roy H. And I'm a drunk. When you come to church, you have to say, I'm a sinner. And this is the last place in the world that I deserve to be, but it's the best place in the world that I need to be. And God has made every one of us sinners 
so that his righteousness alone dwells in us. And we recognize that we are not saved by our own hand. So maybe this morning God's dealing with you about your pride, your strength, your alleged or proposed or imagined strength, or your imagined privilege in this world, or your imagined status, or your imagined wealth, or your imagined wisdom. And God's dealing with you about that. Because you think like I thought that it was a blessing for God to call me because of what I can do. And in one day, God took everything away from me. And I had nothing. And in one day, God gave it back better than I ever had it. So maybe you're here today and you just need to get before God and say, God, I'm not who I think I am. And maybe I'm too strong to serve you. Maybe I'm too smart. Or maybe I'm too good to serve you. If that's you today, maybe you need to get alone with God. And let God teach you that you're not that person. Army's too big. There's too much strength, too many weapons. <coughs> Father, we come before you today. And I thank you, God, that you don't always bring people down to an altar after I preach. I don't need that. You reminded me, Father, one day that I was preaching to sell the, uh, the altar service. I was thinking, God, that if I didn't get anybody down, then I failed. But if I got people down to the altar, then I did a great job. And Father, you reminded me that that's not how it is. You taught me those things. And God, I thank you for them. So I'm free. Free in knowing, God, that if you preach to them, it doesn't have to be at the altar. But it will be. And you'll do it long past the decisions that they might make today. And Father, Lord, if somebody is listening to me today, and they have thought of themselves, that they are more than what they really are, and Father, take them down the road, love them like you love me, take them down the road, and break them, and show them who they really are, and do it, Father, because you love them, because you want them to lean on you, not you leaning on them. Father, I pray, dear God, that you would help those that are weak, those that are not strong, those that are not wise, those that are foolish, those that are despised, those that have been base, those, Lord, that other people have put down all their lives. Somebody's put them down. Somebody's made fun of them. Somebody's talked down to them. 
Somebody's got them so low, God, but they're the one that you loved and they rejected the people that did that to them. Thank you, God, for doing that to me. And Father, do it for them as well. Father, there's somebody here or somebody listening that they're too low. And they thank God that because of who they are and what they've done, that they could never, ever serve you because of how bad they are and what bad things they've done. But Father, help them to understand that they are in a congregation of people that have done terrible things. And every day, they try to walk away from that and make, asking you, God, to make them better than what they were. And God, you're doing it. So, Father, if there's somebody here that's just been put down so low and so far that they think they can't be used, God, show them that they're the exact ones that you call Father bless your people today I love them and I know you Lord you love them way more than I do and Father we just ask God that you bless the word that has been brought to these people use it Father for your glory your kingdom thank you Lord for Bethel and for who we are and what you've made us into we give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name and all the God's people said, Amen. Amen. Are you glad you came to God's house this morning? Amen. Take a stand. Take a stand. Take a stand. Stand on your feet. Stand for what's right. Amen. Stand for the calling. And the calling is, it's dinner time. Amen. Amen. We've got turkey We've got, there's no doubt in my mind, we've got uh, broccoli casserole, deviled eggs, mashed potatoes, gravy, rolls and biscuits. What else do you need? Amen? We want you to stay and eat with us.